In this video, we are going to discuss essential statistical concepts that are needed for an LNASIC data analysis. Statistics, in one word, is the study of the collection, the analysis, the interpretation, the presentation, and the organization of data. The essential concepts that we will address here are a number of distributions the concept of p-value, and some aspect of biological and technical replication. One of the most essential distribution in parametric statistics is the normal distribution. The normal distribution has two parameters, the mean and the variance. And this distribution is very often used and is the underlying assumption of many statistical tests, such as, for example, the t-test. The number of standard deviations from the mean is also an indicator of the normal distribution, and it can sometimes be represented as z-scores. Another distribution is the so-called Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution is a discrete probability distribution that expresses the probability of a number of events to occur a fixed interval of time and or space, provided that these events have an average rate that is known and that an event happens independently from the event that has happened before. The Poisson distribution is also a parameterized distribution, but only has one parameter, so-called lambda, and lambda is both the mean and the variance of a Poisson distribution. A Poisson distribution is often used in modeling the counting of random events. Another distribution, the gamma distribution, is another distribution that has a continuous probability and that has two different parameters. These parameters are the scale and the shape. Two well-known examples of the gamma distribution, which is a generic distribution, are the exponential and the chi-square distribution. As I said, the gamma distribution is a generic distribution. So in a sense, it's a do-it-all distribution. For example, in neuroscience, when studying electroencephalograms, one can use the gamma distribution to describe the distribution of the interspikes intervals. In bacterial gene expression, one can model the relationship between the number of constitutive expressed protein as a gamma distribution, where the scale represents the average number of expression bursts in every cell cycle and the shape parameter represents the average number of proteins that a single mRNA can produce during its lifetime. Finally, and more in relation to the topic of a functional genomics course, the gamma distribution has been used in techniques such as chip chip and chip seq data analysis to detect peak calling. In other words, to recognize signal from noise. This is a topic we will come back to during the CHIPSIC lecture. This is the three important distribution that we need to be aware of when we do rna data analysis as the actual model that an rna data follows is built on this three. Another important concept that we need to do, and especially if we think of doing some different type of statistical test, is a p-value. A p-value is a probability of obtaining a test statistic as extreme as the one that is observed, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. There are a lot of implications in using p-values. And the fact that if we get an extreme p-value that we can reject the null hypothesis 
does not mean that not having an extreme p-value means that we can accept Bonal hypothesis. Indeed, the evidence of an absence is not an absence of evidence. I always get messed up with this one, so I'll try again. The evidence, the absence of evidence, is not an evidence of the absence. Some very important point with p values is that what happens if, for example, in our study design example, where we have 40,000 tests to perform, that we need to, we will get 40,000 p-values. Does that have any implication that we do the test, same test, exact same test, 40,000 times, and we repeat it again and again and again? Will that affect the outcome? Will that affect the answer that we get for our biological question? And of course, me bringing it up, you already see that yes, it does. And that's why we have this concept of adjusted p values. An adjusted p value, or in other words, um, something you can read on Wikipedia under the name of multiple testing, is the correction for doing a large number of times the same statistical test. And here are two examples that hopefully make you grasp this concept of multiple testing. Imagine that we consider the efficacy of a drug in terms of the reduction of any one of a number of the symptoms the disease is associated with. The more symptoms you consider, the more likely it is that the drug will appear to have or to be of an improvement over the drugs in terms of at least one of these symptoms. If you consider only two symptoms, it's unlikely that your drug looks better than any other. If you consider 20,000 symptoms, then the chances that your drug is better than another one has also been increased. <coughs> in other words, Let's consider the safety of the same drug in terms of the occurrence of different type of side effects. The more side effects you consider, the more likely it is that this drug will appear to be less safe than existing drugs, other drugs, in terms of at least one side effect. So this should make it clear that the more we do a test, the more likely it is that some of these tests will be significant just by chance. And for that, these tests need to be subjected to a multiple tested correction. To correct for multiple testing, there are different methods. And if we go back to our example, and where we have 40,000 tests, comparing once for every gene, comparing set of male samples versus the set of female sample, we will get 40,000 p-values. And then the, to adjust the p-values, we can use different methods. A very stringent method is the so-called Bonferroni method. And basically what you do is you multiply every single test p-value by the number of tests you conducted. So in our example, we multiply the p-value we obtained for every genes by 40,000. This is a very conservative approach. There are some approaches that are more elaborate, such as the Benyamini or Berg one, which roughly described the smallest p-value that you obtain, so the most significant, will be multiplied by the number of tests you have performed. The second smallest p-value, so the second most significant p-value, will be multiplied by the number of tests you have performed minus one. The third one by the number of tests minus two, and so on and so forth. In other words, the most significant p-value kept the most corrected, whereas the least significant p-value kept the least correct. This 
was the two important aspects that I wanted to discuss about p-values and adjusted p-values. Adjusted p-values can sometimes be named q-values or also, depending on the statistics that are used, false discovery rates, in short, FDR. Now let's move on to the need for replicates, which is another prerequisite for doing and understanding RNA-seq data analysis. And let's first clarify the lexicon. There are two types of replicates. There can be technical replicates, there can be biological replicates. A technical replicate is when the same sample is subjected to the same type of measurement on the same type of measuring device. So it measures only technical variation. A biological replicates are when different samples are submitted to the same experimental protocol. A different sample, it means different sample from possibly different trees or different tissue of the same trees or different part of the same tissue. And this measures the biological variation. Why do we need replicate for? Well, in any experiment, the result of an experiment, and in our case, because we are looking at RNA-seq, the, the gene exp expression that you will measure, the measure you obtain, is going to be the sum of the actual gene expression plus some noise. The noise being either technical, so like when you do the machine, that's the measurement, and has a certain error rate, so it will give different values. Or it can be biological, because the two different samples that you've collected were from cells that were in slightly different part of the cell cycle, for example. So it's important to understand and to model this noise, so that what we can look at is the actual real gene expression, which is what we are after. When it comes to Illumina sequencing, and Illumina is the type of sequencing that is most used nowadays for doing RNA seq studies. There was a paper published in 2010 in Nature by John Marini et al., which looked at the type of replicate that are needed, and it compared technical and biological replicates. And if we look here, for example, at in quadrant A, at a pair of lanes, so two sequencing events, where the sample had the same concentration, what you can see is that we get an almost perfect line, only very little differences between the two replicates. If we do the same with different concentrations, then of course we see that the sample that has more deviates from that previous line. If we run across multiple lanes, we observe the same as if we have the same concentration or if we have different concentration. This means that the sequencing technical noise from an Illumina machine is minimal. Meaning that when you are working on an Illumina machine for an rna -seq experiment, you should favor biological replicate instance of technical replicates, as technical replicates are not going to give you any valuable information because the sequencing technique in itself is extremely reproducible. This is, of course, in the case of using the Illumina sequencing technologies and not any other kind of technology, in which case a proper design or proper analysis of the importance of the technical noise should be done. To conclude, consideration for rna data analysis, from a statistical point of view of course, is that we need at least three biological replicate per condition or per time point. Three is the bare minimum. 
from some colleague statistician of mine and from statistician in general, what you will hear is the more replicate, the merrier. Usually an higher number of replicate has an improvement over the biological noise. So you get a better estimation of the biological noise. And also for an higher number of replicates, you get a significant improvement of the statistical power. This means that if your replicate number of your replicate is high enough, your power to determine whether a gene is differentially expressed or not is also increased. This implies that for the same amount of money you would spend on sequencing, you should rather spend that money on generating more biological replicate than to sequence a few biological replicate to a deeper depth. Of course, I've mentioned money, and another statistician colleague of mine would tell you that you should sequence as many replicates as money can afford, provided that if money is limiting, you would also limit the number of conditions you want to investigate, the number of variables and parameters that you want to investigate. When it comes to modeling and study design, it's extremely important to know how many parameters you expect to vary. In our example of comparing, of looking for sexual dimorphism in Aspen, what we want to compare is the sex. So by default, we have one parameter, which is the sex being male or female. So the minimal setup that we would do for such an experiment would be to have three male replicates and three female replicates. Although we know that in that experiment we expect very few loci to be involved in that sexual dimorphism process, which means that to get significant statistical power, we will probably consider using more replicates than just three. 